yes. A urinal. That's always a great thing to start a lecture with. <laughs> and the question is why? Well, um, what I'd like to do today is to look at how art reflects the times in which it was created, the culture of the 60s. Uh, but first, I'd like to look at some of the precursors to pop art from um, Dada, which we see up here, to abstract expressionism. Would it help having a little bit of light in the back? That's fine. If you want to turn that on, let's, let's try that. that. That's good. We can still see fine. That's, that's great. All right. So uh, what we're looking at here is, is an art movement that was a response to the first mechanized world war, the first use of uh, you know, machinery invented from the Industrial Revolution to kill people. The result of that was some 10 million people killed twice that many wounded and many others psychologically damaged from the kind of massive, intensive destruction of World War I. Uh, every gener the, the generation of artists that created the, that work all knew of people who had died or were wounded. Um, it w had a profound effect on them. And as a result, they created an art that was a protest art, an art against the establishment of a kind of moral de decadence that they saw in Western art. And so artists that were established artists, like Marcel Duchamp, who was highly respected, uh, decided to, to do what he called creating a, a ready-made, something that had already been made before. And he signed it R. Mutt, but that's actually uh, his pseudonym there. Um, this ready-made, then, was something that he said would, had already been created for for him, and all he had to do was sign it, and it became art. Well, of course, this was slapping the face of the art establishment and telling people you know, that this stuff uh, really is not art. This stuff is anti-art. And this essentially was a movement against the art establishment because, as he said, the kind of moral decay that occurred in Europe at this time uh, you know, really uh, makes the art created by this society bereft of any kind of moral values. So uh, he called this fountain, by the way. Um, and then he also found assisted ready-mades. In this case, uh, not the actual Mona Lisa, but a postcard of the Mona Lisa. This was called LHOOQ, which if you'll excuse the language, it, um, if you sound it out in French, uh, it's something you would hear from a construction worker more than you would an actual you know, connoisseur. It, it basically, the pseudonym means she has a hot ass. And sorry for that, but it's true. Um, and the whole idea, you know, instead of thinking of this as, you know, in the realm of cat calls and whistles and so on, uh, this grand lady was probably the most famous art image in Western culture. So the idea that he would put a goatee and a mustache and then use this uh, acronym, is it an acronym? Uh, that sounded out these words that basically were a derogatory slap in the face of the Mona Lisa was another way that he felt uh, the art establishment could be insulted. And the whole idea of Dada was to shock and insult, use chance, irrational effects, things that where the hand of the artist was taken away. Uh, in this case, Kurt Schwitters uh, found garbage around his studio, put them together in a collage to create uh, a design for noble ladies. And this, these were all in response to the, world, the outrage of World War I. So Dada did something quite remarkable. One, it uh, outraged the, the establishment and how things go oftentimes. Within about 10 years, it became a part of the whole canon of Western art. The establishment came to the Dadaists, and of course, that ended the movement, and they went on to other things. What it did for artists in the 20th century is it freed them up to try out new things, to allow found objects to become part of what they were doing. Uh, Pablo Picasso uh, created uh, a bull's head using a, a seat of a bicycle and the handlebars, uh, cast it in bronze later on. And this was influential to uh, uh, later uh, artists that were precursors of, of uh, pop art. One other movement has to be discussed uh, fairly quickly to, to let us know what pop art is responding to. After the war, America was, um, the United States was on top 
Uh, they hadn't had any damage from the war economically. The engines were going. And uh, it was a major consumer culture uh, that was doing very well. Europe, on the other hand, was hobbling along. Uh, and so the, um, the movement of the economies in the United States and of artists from Europe to the United States when they fled the war um, created essentially the first American, modern American movement, abstract expressionism. Uh, abstract expressionism with an artist like Jackson Pollock who eventually um, made it to um, the, the uh, time um, you know, cover was considered uh, by one artist, Motherwell, to be the most hated movement in, in modern art. And it was about 50 guys and some women in New York um, painting um, basically what they felt like painting and painting abstract forms that revealed their inner conscious, their unconscious, their archetypal connection to the rest of the unconscious uh, in the world. Uh, this idea then of painting for the sake of painting, of allowing the painting to be the grand gesture, the heroic kind of uh, you know, expression of oneself on canvas was done no, none better than by Jackson Pollock. Instead of painting on easel, he kind of derogator, derogatorily described easel painting as that of another generation. He put it, uh, the canvases on the floor, and he saw them as a, an arena in which to work. Action painting, where you're slashing and throwing paint down, not using brushes, but using sticks and using knives and using other things to spill paint as you basically danced around the canvas, as you literally were allowing your body to help make the movements of the, of, of the paint rather than allowing the brush stroke to do that. And these guys saw themselves and women uh, as on this major mission, you know, to reveal the unconscious in this kind of heroic gesture. And uh, so Pollock then created these monumental paintings, nine foot by 12, 14 foot paintings. Uh, and other uh, abstract expressionists were, were doing this as well. They had a very small following of collectors and museum goers and other artists. There weren't a lot of the public that really understood this. One critic described this as apocalyptic wallpaper. Uh, essentially, it was, uh, in some ways, though, it had a kernel of truth, a response to the apocalypse of the A-bomb in 1945 in World War I. This kind of art then was the current prevailing art of the day. Pop artists, on the other hand, um, like good children in a sense, were responding to this lack of imagery, this idea of the heroic gesture of, of the kind of art that uh, they felt was bereft of context in a society that had changed radically in 10 years. I'll give you an example of some of those changes. Television, for example. Uh, at the beginning of 1950, television in American households, there were 1.5 million televisions. The beginning of 1960, there were 85 million televisions in American households. You can imagine that huge growth, the kind of captive audience that was there. Advertising increased at, at, a, at a, con, a considerable rate as, a, as well. And essentially, this created a kind of consumer culture, a consumer culture that um, the early pop artists and others were responding to. The earliest neo-Dada uh, kind of transition between abstract expressionists, Dadaists, and pop artists. One is, uh, that we see here is Robert Rauschenberg, who did the same thing as Kurt Schwitters. He wandered around the streets outside of his studio and picked up garbage. Uh, there was an old secondhand store down the street where he found this stuffed Angora goat. He found the, the um, the tire, and he placed it within the tire, painted the nose to, you know, to give his homage to the abstract expressionist, you know, to say, here, you know, I can paint like you guys. And there it is on the nose of, of the Angora goat, as we can see. Uh, oh, there, using the stick. It's called Monogram. This was done uh, in 1957, and uh, this is what, uh, 59. This is what is called a combine, where he combined various elements and put them together in, in this work. He also responded to television and the idea with television that you have messages that come to you in small packets of information and these messages are discontinuous. You know, uh, you get one thing flashing after another that are unrelated 
And so he started to find images and take photographs and silkscreen them onto canvas. And this is a printing process that kind of takes away the hand of the artist. It can become a mechanized process. And this is something that we start to see in common with uh, pop artists, this idea of mechanizing the process, of actually moving away from uh, depicting things like the abstract expressionists with the you know, grand gesture, the heroic brushstroke. So here we see images from the time. We see uh, an astronaut coming to Earth. We see uh, Kennedy, President uh, uh, John F. Kennedy here. There are oranges over here, uh, another version of Kennedy's hand, and some other images kind of discontinuously placed together here. Um, What's interesting about this, I think, uh, first of all, this was done in 1964. Kennedy had recently um, been assassinated. And in some people's eyes, he was kind of deified. Um, this image that we see in the bottom corner here uh, has resonances with an ancient, ancient, a Renaissance image of Adam and Eve cast out of the garden, the avenging angel above, the hand of God nearby. Uh, and if you look back at this image, um, you might say that Kennedy's hand, uh, and so that we get the message, he repeated it again, the idea of repetition is important, is taking, uh, is, is uh, telling these people to leave. Uh, and so, so this essentially is the hand of God uh, shooing Adam and Eve out of the garden, uh, profoundly, um, you know, kind of um, moving them out and moving beyond, you might say, the kind of traditional representation that that represented and, and moving towards a much more um, kind of radical approach to art. Jasper Johns, uh, another uh, Dada artist or precursor to Dada, um, was once Comment, once commented that his uh, gallery um, director is, is the owner of the gallery. Leo Castelli could sell anything. He said, I, I bet he could sell uh, a couple of beer cans. And so what he did is he used two beer cans that we have here, Ballantine Ale, bronze them, and yes, Castelli was able to sell these cans. So um, he essentially was uh, taking the found object, the object that we saw earlier in Dada art, and taking common everyday objects and elevating them to high art. Um, as we can see here, this is a common everyday object in one sense. This is the American flag. It's not really the American flag. It's the painting of, of three flags by Jasper Johns. And, and what he says about this is he wanted to use things so simple and familiar that, as he put it, they left him free to work on other levels. And uh, so well known that they were not well seen, as John said, using the design of the American flag took care of a great deal for me because I didn't have to design it. So I went on to similar things like targets, things the mind already knows, and so on. And here we see uh, something that everyone looks at and is so aware of that they don't really study it. And what Johns is telling us to do essentially is to slow down and to maybe look at this more closely and essentially to look at the painting uh, of, of this flag. It's done in encaustic, which is wax with pigment embedded. And encaustic, when you paint with it, uh, you have to heat it up and it leaves the brush strokes very quickly because it is a paint uh, that dries very quickly. And so you see the kind of gestures and the brush strokes. And he wanted people to see that as a painting. And he kind of worked in this area between symbol, the symbol of the American flag, or sign, and, and art. And he was trying to play with this idea of mediating between, is this art or is this just a sign of, or a symbol that we're all accustomed to seeing? Excuse me. <clears throat> He also liked the idea that this was an ex inherently flat image, um, like the target that we see here. Uh, or here, oh, he, he did a little kind of optical illusion here, and I want you all to participate in this. What you need to do is you need to stare at the little white dot at the top of the American flag that we see up here. Um, and you need to stare at that without blinking for, well, half a minute at least. Stare, I want everyone staring at that dot. OK, and after a half minute or so goes by, uh, then you can look at this black dot down here, and I want you to tell me what you see. <clears throat> He's painting to show us 
in a sense, um, that there are various ways that we can look at objects that are, you know, kind of common, uh, you know, things inherent to who we are. Now, these were controversial paintings, as, as Richard Osborne had said. Uh, these were met with derision. You know, everyone was still painting abstractly, you know, and to see images like this show up, and the American flag, I mean, this was, this was uh, quite controversial. Did everyone see that? What'd you see? The actual flag below. So it has to do with the way our eyes work optically, the idea of an after image and all that. We don't have time to get into it, but it's an interesting phenomenon. And it's why complementary colors um, are uh, so important in cr intensifying other colors. But let's take a look at um, target with four faces. Again, the target is an idea that everyone sees, but do you really see and understand it? And the purpose of a target is, is to shoot at it, basically. Uh, and this is one to look at, to kind of see as an all over kind of painting, rather than something that you're focusing, hyper focused on the, the middle of. And to add to its kind of uh, iconic sense, he added four plaster casts of four faces that are in these boxes above and can be dropped down. Uh, the, Top can be dropped down so you see them or don't see them. Well, this is, uh, according to Lucy Lippard, or Lippard um, she said that pop art was born twice. And it was born in Britain, and it was born in the United States. The first time, we see the British artist Richard Hamilton in this collage saying, just, this is the name of the collage, just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? And as we can see in this collage, it has everything to do with consumerism, right? We have um, the, this kind of um, joke of this kind of Adam and Eve of, of the consumer uh, in a consumer paradise. Of course, this is the modern technology of the time in 1956. This was the kind of recording device that everyone was accustomed to. Um, but we have here, you know, modern uh, Ford emblem, you know, ham, uh, television sets all these other things. And then we have a kind of um, classical referencing of the Greek spear bearer that we see right here on the left. But he's not really bearing a spear, is he? He's bearing a Tootsie Pop, which is a kind of a sexual joke. I, I don't know if you guys get it, but well, there it is. Um, I'm kidding. I'm sure you do. And there she is uh, as a, a kind of reclining Venus, a figure um, who, um, well, the lampshade sort of gives away maybe that she just had come home from a party and is a little, well. Anyway, what we're looking at here is art, according to Hamilton, in terms of his list of what pop art should be. This is art that's popular, designed for mass audience. These are his words now. It's transient, show, uh, which has a short-term solution. It's expendable, easily forgotten, low cost, mass produced, young, aimed at youth, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, big business. These are all the things that pop art should be. And this is a kind of uh, envious look across the Atlantic to the Americans who are you know, examples of all this work, this kind of consumer culture here. By the way, this is the idealized male of the day, Charles Atlas, that we see here um, holding up the Tootsie Pop. And um, he is the kind of you know, idealized equivalent of the Greek nude that we had seen a moment before. Well, this then movement in, in, um, in England um, moved across the pond to the United States. And an artist like Roy Lichtenstein, or Lichtenstein um, illuminated some of the trends going on in pop art. And here we have uh, a series. These are based on a series of teen uh, kind of uh, comic strips, DC comics, f both targeted for male and female audiences. Here, here, here we have, we rose up slowly as if we didn't belong to the outside world any longer like swimmers in a shadowy dream who didn't need to breathe. Oh, yes, my heart is just from that. Isn't that just marvelous? Uh, of course, there's a very large kind of stereotypic assumption here. We have two blonde, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, idealized kind of, you know, uh, figures in this scene here. Um, uh, and, and we see here, uh, in one sense, Men portrayed as kind of the, the strong figure and the women, 
you know, passive in this. But this is also based on these comic strips. And, and the thing that Lichtenstein was trying to do in this case is to move away from the depiction of the brush stroke um, and trying to use a kind of uh, automation in the way he created this. In the shadows here, we see what are called bende dots, that he wanted to create uh, these images as if they were printed um, from comic books themselves. And he was also interested in kind of slashing at the kind of prevailing art of the day, abstract expressionists, in creating what he described here as a little big painting, taking the major brushstroke, the heroic gesture of the abstract expressionists, and making it flat, and making it automated, making it kind of mass produced, factory produced, using these print, printer's dots, Bendet dots, as a way to say um, that basically this is just more mass consumer culture. There's nothing unique uh, about what the abstract expressionists are doing. Uh, and here we can see an example of abstract expressionists, the grand ge gesture and uh, the parody of it, essentially. One of the things that he also was interested in doing besides elevating consumer culture to high art. And this was extremely controversial because people felt that their art should be rarefied and unique. And this is not rarefied and unique. This is art that is down in the trenches with popular culture. We have um, this guy saying, I pressed the, the fire control and ahead of me rockets blaze through the sky, wham, we see this destruction. So, what Liechtenstein is doing here is he's portraying men as strong, virile soldiers and fighter pilots. Well, he's not actually doing it. He's um, depicting these from comic books for young boys. Well, how are women portrayed in this case? I don't care. I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. The, here the women are portrayed stereotypically, and this is the way advertisers saw that they were also going to be selling their products, where women are shown as emotionally distraught, dependent on men, and happily uh, slaving around the house in the domestic world and so on. So on. Uh, and here we have uh, a man, again, in, as a warrior, you know, you know, fighting in his macho role. And then uh, we have the woman here saying, may maybe he became ill and couldn't leave the studio. He was also happy to throw in the kind of inside joke, you know, that uh, you know, he was the artist and this was the woman who was pining after him and concerned and so on. So women in this case were dealt with um, as, as uh, subservient to the roles of, of men in these, in these comic uh, kind of um, uh, uh, books for, for teenagers. So he made these paintings a mirror of contemporary society. He revealed the kind of stereotyping deeply embedded in the media. And I, I think that's interesting because um, you know, we think of pop art as kind of neutral or cool. But in a sense, it also, uh, in the best sense, is a kind of social critique of uh, the kind of issues of the day. Well, Andy Warhol was probably the most famous of the pop artists and also the one who was um, most outrageous to the art establishment. He actually showed, his first solo show was not in New York, where we think of him, but was in the Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles, which was a, a kind of avant-garde gallery in, in LA in the 60s. And he showed these 32 paintings of Campbell soup cans, and they're silk screen, some hand painted or whatever, but there are 32 varieties of Campbell's soup. So he has 32 paintings, and he painted each of them um, and offered them for, in 62 for $100 a piece. The gallery next door was so outraged at this show that they put actual Campbell's soup cans in the window and said, these are selling for 29 cents a piece. You know, which would you prefer, right? So they were you know, making comment that these weren't art. These were just you know, throwing in the face of the public the fact that true artists have to create art out of, you know, using you know, their skills as craftsmen and all the rest. Well, he went further than that. Not only does he show us the kind of consumerism, this is as, as if we're at a um, supermarket checkout with a pile of Coke bottles here and so on. The repetition of images is revealing the kind of consumerist sameness of all images in the culture. But he went one step further, and he asked the question here, if I can find that here. Um, I want to be a machine, don't you? This was his quote. and he not only thought of himself in this way, um, 
But he, he acted on this. He called his studio the factory. He had assistants making his work. He specified what they would be, and then he just simply signed them. He never really worked on many of these pieces. These pieces were done uh, with silk screen and other processes that remove the hand of the artist. And to remove his presence from it one step further, he had his assistants doing these pieces. And he thought of Marilyn Monroe as another kind of commodity, in a sense, just you know, like uh, the kind of commodities that we see with consumer products, uh, the celebrity you know, sold in the newsstand with everything else. Uh, other kinds of images of the day uh, we see here. Um, this was a more serious kind of repetition of images of uh, the day that was, uh, is what it's called. Jackie uh, Onassis Kennedy is seen here. Um, the day of the, um, memori the, the memorial for JFK after his assassination. So. Uh, other kind of images that we see here, duplicating the same image, repeating them over and over again. Race riot uh, is what we're looking at here. Uh, is also a sign of the times and the kind of civil unrest that is depicted in these images. So by repeating the image over and over again, he questions the traditional notion of an artwork as a unique expression of the individual artist. Um, just in this sense, if nothing else, this was the kind of thing that people just weren't uh, able to deal with. I mean, the idea that low popular culture could be the stuff of high art and the hand of the artist removed from it and the repetition of this. He was also interested, oh, I'm sorry. So we move on past uh, him to Edward Ruscha's images of gas stations. He really liked popular images like this. And he created a kind of gee whiz, kind of wow kind of factor here. The standard station here is a kind of pun on the word of the standard as well as the kind of model for good behavior. Oh, I don't need that. Um, and the idea of something is having uh, this kind of idealized um, um, uh, standing for us. Uh, but the image itself, as you can see, has a strong diagonal, this kind of raking perspective. It's made um, to look fast and kind of sexy. The, the technology of the day, the reigning technology of the day, was the car. The car was the most gee whiz, kind of wow sort of stuff uh, that was happening for the commoner, the common person. And uh, so these stations were made to look like uh, they could take off. Here we have uh, Tom uh, Wesselman and um, basically looking at advertising, looking at images of advertising, looking at how women are portrayed, especially in these series of women's mouths that he does and women smoking, and revealing the not to, um, you know, I guess the very obvious idea that sex sells. Um, these sensual kind of images were designed uh, to portray the, that kind of aspect of of consumer culture. George Siegel, another artist that we see here, um, looking at the kind of uh, idea of portraiture and the kind of anonymous, kind of lonely, isolated individual uh, kind of con you know, confronting the kind of media in this image uh, called Cinema R. Or um, a depiction in a more inside way of George Siegel, uh, uh, um, collector, his gallery director, uh, Sidney Janis, contemplating a work of, of Mondrian in this, in this image that we see here. Um, the idea here is to place the individual in an environment, uh, an environment that uh, kind of shows their role in the world and to capture something about their uh, sense of who they are. Uh, Escobar Marisol, um, creating images, in this case, uh, an image of strong women in contrast to the often stereotypical view of women presented in mainstream media here. Um, so there's a kind of interjection of social consciousness into the domain of pop art. It's an interesting kind of combined image with actual doors and hinges and actual sneakers on, uh, and on the feet of these uh, figures and also painted elements and so on. Um, so there's this kind of ongoing dialectic in her work between the high and low cultures that we see here uh, and a, a much more upscale kind of family um, she, she's portraying in these images. 
Well, pop art reflected the concerns of the consumer culture that developed in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and this kind of post-war focus and orientation um, had stereotypical roles of men and women that we saw with Lichtenstein, the idea of women portrayed as subservient and, and you know, passive, and men portrayed as doers and fighters and so on. Um, and so part of their you know, uh, role uh, was to, to bring these to the light of, of, of the audience. Uh, and also to talk about the uh, um, idea of mass-produced products and making paintings that reflect that very concern and the ubiquitousness of advertising where, of course, sex sells. So this is a movement that casts popular or low culture in the context of the high arts or fine art, causing us to slow down a little and see this phenomena of consumerism a little more critically. Um, this, I think, was probably the most uh, important goal of the pop artist is to look critically at the trends of the day and how consumerism had really taken over, you might say, the consciousness of, of the culture. The media was, you know, hyper-focused on that. Uh, somebody described television as, the, as a box for selling products, basically. Um, and so this idea was so new and unique after, after World War II um, that artists couldn't help but uh, get involved in portraying this. And in spite of its kind of shocking reception and so on, it has become a kind of established way of seeing the world. All right, thank you. Any questions? So maybe if we have the, li the lights on or are there lights somewhere? Yes. How come when the flag was uh, printed in green, black, and yellow? Yes. Was that should, um, is there something about contrasting colors? Yes. Uh, what happens, we, the way we see colors, we have, I mean, I'm really simplifying this, but we have paired cones that when we see looking at red, we have its paired complementary opposite, uh, it, which is green. And when we stare at something for a while, it, it tires out the receptor for green. And what takes over is what's called the afterimage, and that's red and black and white and, and uh, blue and orange. So, so, so um, the orange becomes blue. It's, it's afterimage. And it's just physiologically how we, how we see color. And that's why when we have these opposite colors, these together, they seem to intensify each other. They have a kind of vibratory harmony. Other questions? We're a quiet group. I'm used to people going, but uh, I, I, I didn't understand that. What, what, what were you doing? Yes, yes. I noticed that um, there were two kind of pop art movements going along in the same year. Like yes. Time. What was the time frame of the two? Like, did it start during Great the Britain began in the 50s and uh, really took hold in that, at that time. And they were more interested almost in a kind of objective ways uh, in studying um, mass media and mass culture and then in their artworks kind of revealing the results of that study um, and they were kind of from the outside looking on in America it really took hold in the 60s and here it was just being immersed in this culture kind of you know responding to it in a much more bold and aggressive way generally so it really kind of took hold it in that way here yes uh, Escobar Marisol, uh, a, a woman artist who uh, kind of bridges, a, you know, a few areas, but she's a, 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 an interesting pop artist in the way she depicts uh, women and kind of a counter to the prevailing stereotype of the day. Yes, Ira. It lasted into the late '60s, and it kind of transformed itself. Some aspects of the movement I really didn't talk about, um, such as with George Siegel's installations, there were these ideas of environments and happenings, and it morphed into these kind of more conceptual areas, and in photorealism, where the photograph became the basis uh, for, for art. Um, and you can kind of see how that begins with the comic book you know, image becoming the basis, and then just taking it one step further and saying, well, the photograph is also ubiquitous. Why don't we make paintings from photographs? And so, yes, Karen. You mentioned that the pop art um, movement was not accepted early on among the general artist community. 
Like yes. Like General Augustine. I, I presume it is now. And it I is now. When, when did that happen? How did that? It probably happened slowly, I guess. But. Right. It, I, I, it did happen fairly slowly. Um, the earliest artists like um, Johns and Rauschenberg in the late 50s and early 60s, um, you know, the, nobody knew what to do with their stuff. They had a, a show at the Janus Gallery called The New Realism in 62, and when they showed their work, there was just this kind of dumbfoundness, what's going on? So 62, the, in terms of the, lang the, the criticism of the day and so on, people were saying, well, this is an art, this is just... I could buy this on the newsstand. Stuff, you know, the Ferris Gallery, and, and that was also in '62. The idea of actually, you know, putting a soup cans in the window and saying this is cheaper at 29 cents or or 100 dollars. Which would you prefer? So, I don't so know. It took, so like, it took some time. Did you say like 20 years? Or no, no, no. I, things were moving quickly. We're talking about um, '65, and it, it became okay. it became a movement that everyone just assumed. And by that time. Um, it was starting to be supplanted by these other forms, and within a decade, it really was kind of the grand old movement. Oh, you know, right. the new generation had moved on. Right. Okay. Question. Yes. That wall behind you is that considered pop art? That's interesting because you would. Uh, that's probably closer to op art, which is kind of optical kind of um, art that sometimes uh, is related to altered states of consciousness and so on. That was a part of, of the 60s. Uh, so it, it's a kind of a parallel movement. But dealing with the very idea that we were talking about, about optical sensations, uh, very much focused on that. So there was a crossover. Yes, Rob. <laughs> They're millions. The soup cans are pretty small. I mean, it's a wall of 32 of them, and each painting was worth $100. And now we're talking, well, they're probably not over, they're probably worth, each one is probably worth half a million dollars, you know. Uh, so what was once $100, you wish you were there buying that, right, uh, is, is, is quite valuable. In spite of the fact that he, in, f in fact, those are extremely valuable because those were the last hand-painted works that he did. From that point on, he conceived of the idea and had assistants working on them. So um, they're kind of unique in that sense early kind of works. And, there, and it's interesting how that kind of mass product, uh, produced object can become a valued co um, commodity in the art world uh, in, in a way, too. Co the commodification of art was an issue that kind of killed pop art at one point and, and started the, the, the conceptual artists creating work that was not sellable because they realized it was buying into the same ideas that they were critiquing in, in the work. Yes, Ira. Is there a critique of pop culture that happens in the significant form of the effect on pop culture? I, I think the one thing that, that it brought was awareness, um, kind of like media does today. I mean, has anyone seen Mad Men, for example? I mean, that's a great kind of look back into the, these times and advertising and so on. But it's an awareness of, of the prevalence of consumerism. When you're in it and you're doing it, you don't think about it. It's not a big deal, you know. Yeah, I've got to go out and buy this. I'm going to get, get a new pair of shoes or do that, whatever. But if you're seeing this cast in a new context, it's high art, then you have to say, well, it must... Somebody thinks it's valuable, so it must be saying something. What is it saying to us? So I think, it, I don't know how widespread that, that knowledge was, but it, in the literati, in the intellectual, in the writings of the day, it was is pretty well known because of the movement. And it found its way out. Andy Warhol is probably also well known for his paintings of Disney uh, characters, his prints of Disney characters. Um, and that um, kind of made him, you know, hyper celebrity. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.